The final piece of the U.S. privacy law puzzle is what is known as state common law. Common law means law developed by judges rather than written by legislatures. America inherited its common law system from the British during colonization. Centuries ago, pre-Twitter, when the word of the English king was the law of the land, but the king could not be everywhere at once, he would send his deputies out to hear and settle disputes based on societal norms of right and wrong, justice and equity. These early judges sought to treat like cases alike, and so looked to prior cases, precedent, to help judge new cases that presented similar facts. Over many years of doing this, judges developed a set of rules for the community at large, the common law. One type of common law is what is known as tort law. A tort is a harm to person or property that a private party can seek a remedy for in court, and that is not so bad that we want to treat it as a crime, a harm to the society itself and not just to the individual. Tort law is fundamentally about what duties members of a community owe to one another and what types of harms the law is prepared to recognize and address, even without a statute to rely on. Tort law is developed by state judges, and sometimes it is also written into state statutes, which judges then interpret and apply. It reflects the culture and values of each state. All 50 states have recognized some types of privacy harms that support a tort claim. The original idea for this comes from an 1890 Harvard Law Review article by Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis. Brandeis would later sit on the Supreme Court. Appalled by the rise of mass circulation newspapers and gossip sheets, aided by the newfangled camera, they argued that the common law needed to develop an enforceable privacy right based on, quote, the right to be let alone. Seventy years later, a legal scholar named William Prosser wrote a law review article that organized privacy concerns and harms into four distinct invasion of privacy tort claims. Although each state shapes the standards a little differently, they can be generally stated like this. First, intrusion upon seclusion. This means intruding upon another's seclusion or solitude or into her private affairs. In other words, intruding into something in which the person has a reasonable expectation of privacy and in a manner that is offensive to a reasonable person. In some states, the intrusion must be highly offensive. Second, public disclosure of private facts. This means publicly disclosing private information that is not on a matter of public concern and whose disclosure would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. Third, false light publicity. This means knowingly or recklessly placing someone before the public eye in a false light. This is similar to defamation, but defamation is about harming someone's reputation, especially their professional reputation. False light publicity is more about causing someone mental distress by creating a false impression about them in a manner that would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. And fourth, misappropriation. This means appropriating someone's name or likeness for one's own commercial advantage. Let's pause there. For TDM researchers, only the first two of these are likely to have any real relevance. Presumably, no researcher will be engaging in the behavior described in numbers three or four. Note that having external funding for research isn't the same thing as using someone's likeness for commercial advantage. People sometimes make a fifth type of tort claim seen here and known as intentional infliction of emotional distress. States vary in how they formulate this tort, but it usually involves intentional or reckless behavior that is extreme and causes severe emotional distress. It seems highly unlikely that any responsible researcher, and certainly no one participating in this institute, would do anything to run afoul of the standard. One court has described it as behavior that is, quote, so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized community, close quote. To give you an example, one court allowed a claim of intentional infliction of emotional distress to go to a jury when Shaquille O'Neal posted to Twitter and Instagram a picture of a private person whose medical condition caused some distortion to his face and teeth and a side-by-side -side shot of O'Neal contorting his face to match with the caption, smile people. The court emphasized the power and balance between the two and that society, quote, finds it especially reprehensible for the strong to pick on the weak. 
Let's go back to the first two types of claims here, intrusion upon seclusion and public disclosure of private facts, which conceivably could arise in the context of TDM. Intrusion upon seclusion could arise with respect to how researchers acquire data for analysis. Public disclosure could arise if personally identifiable data were published with research findings or included in a data set made available to enable further study or replication. When the data involved are already publicly available, however, like the data involved in the use cases, it is unlikely a court would uphold either claim. Prior cases generally reject claims that involve matters already open to the public, including photos, Facebook posts, and other materials voluntarily shared by individuals on the internet. For example, in the Shaquille O'Neal case, the court rejected an intrusion on seclusion claim because it looked like O'Neal got the photo from the man's own public Instagram account. The court also rejected a public disclosure of private facts claim because, again, the man had made the photo publicly available on Instagram and because it involved his face, which is readily viewable and not a private aspect of his life. Similarly, another court held that a reporter did not invade the privacy of Navy SEALs when she downloaded photos of them abusing Abu Ghraib prisoners from a smug mug site that was publicly accessible even though the site owner did not realize it or intend to make the photos available. Nor did the reporter invade their privacy when she wrote a widely circulated news story about abuse of prisoners using the photographs. The court noted that the degree of intrusion was minimal, with the reporter merely conducting a search on the internet and using no deception in locating and downloading the images. The SEALs could take no refuge in the fact that they intended that only certain individuals could gain access to the website. An objectively reasonable person, the court said, could not expect such photos to remain private under these circumstances. The social value of the reporting was readily apparent, and showing the faces of the SEALs and their expressions formed an integral part of the reporting on potential mistreatment of prisoners. Even though cases tend to find that people have no reasonable expectation of privacy in what they publicly share on the internet, I want to emphasize a few things. First, courts pay close attention to the facts and invasion of privacy cases, and every state interprets the standards somewhat differently. Also, as I mentioned in the last video, courts are starting to ask whether the fact of posting something to the internet should necessarily eliminate any expectation of privacy in how those data are later used, especially if the technology-enabled aggregation of disparate bits of data may reveal something intimate or sensitive that reasonable people would not want revealed. Of course, gaining new insights from large troves of data is precisely what TDM is all about. Privacy law is struggling with how to formulate rules for this that preserve personal responsibility for what we reveal about ourselves with the power of big data and artificial intelligence and the inherently adaptive notion of a reasonable expectation of privacy. In the common law, answers come gradually, case by case, as one or two courts modify doctrine and others use their decisions as precedent. What this means for researchers is that we should pay attention to how state privacy tort law develops with respect to big data. Three other things to note. First, the more data we obtain, use, and publish are anonymized or de-identified, the less risk arises under any state privacy tort. Second, privacy rights in US law are personal, meaning they terminate when we die. This means that using data concerning people who have died cannot give rise to invasion of privacy torts. There is one exception to this that is unlikely to matter for our purposes. Some states have created rights of publicity that extend commercial control over one's name, likeness, and other features beyond one's death and allow them to be bequeathed to others. Third, TDM is likely to involve data of people who live in more than one state and not necessarily in the same state as the researcher or researchers who may be in different states themselves. If one or more data subjects wanted to claim invasion of privacy, which state's law would apply to decide whether an invasion had occurred? When more than one state's law may relate to a claim, courts generally apply the law of the place with the strongest ties to the issue in dispute. They tend to focus on the place where the harm occurred or where the conduct causing the harm occurred. As a practical matter, we can't keep track of dynamic tort laws in 50 states. It helps that state privacy tort standards are roughly similar. 
It also helps to begin thinking not just about law, but about ethics and norms. Because after all, the law, especially tort law, is supposed to reflect what the community thinks is right about how we should treat one another. In the next video, we'll talk about how privacy law relates to ethics and institutional norms.